Today's scripture reading is taken from the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, verse 2. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing that, some have entertained angels without knowing it. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Friends, pray with me. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations in all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. Amen. We welcome everyone to grow with us. That's the phrase in the middle of our mission statement. And if, if something's in the middle, we might call that the heart of the matter. If you, if you have a sandwich, it's the middle that names the sandwich. It's, it's a hamburger, or it's a ham and cheese, or it's a, it's a tuna melt. I mean, you might like rye bread, or wheat bread, or croissants, but without the middle, you've just got toast, right? It's, it's the middle, the heart of things that really matter, and this is the heart of our community. We want to be a community that is open and inclusive, and through the diverse gifts that all of you bring to the table and bring to the community, we seek to be a thriving and healthy example of the body of Christ. Now, welcoming everyone and, and growing together, that sounds pretty simple and easy, right? How many churches do you think do a good job of it? You know that almost every church in America has a sign out front that says, everyone welcome here. And yet we often doubt that that's true. Because we often send these often unconscious nonverbal messages of judgment. Welcome here, but if you're divorced or gay or you were an alcoholic or you lost your job or you asked too many questions, well, you're not as welcome. I went to a church in Northern Ireland that said right at the front that women had to wear hats or they were not welcome because it said somewhere in Paul that women should cover their heads in church. A century ago, H. Richard Niebuhr published The Social Sources of Denominationalism, and he said that 10 o'clock is the most segregated hour in America, and that became a, a phrase that Martin Luther King Jr. adopted to say how, how we can get caught that most churches look like a specific ethnic, class, or lifestyle enclave rather than reflecting the diversity within their own community. Churches can become like the restaurant that only serves one thing. You know, some places are just, they're just a taco stand. Or they only have hamburgers, or they only have pizza. And if you come to the, you know, if you come to the pizza place and you want a taco, you say, no, the, that's that church down the street. If you like tacos, you go to that church because we're a pizza church. Or there's, there's mega churches that are like the Greek diner. They've got that menu that takes you an hour to read and decide. And there's something there for everyone, but none of it's really great. Like the moussaka and the meatloaf taste strangely alike. <laughs> I don't know how that works. If we were a restaurant, as a church, what would we serve? We'll come back to that at the end. How do we defy the odds to really mean it, to be a genuine, welcoming, open, and growing community? Well, so that word welcome, it doesn't often appear in the Bible. Usually the biblical word is hospitality. From the Latin hospice, right? We, we get the word for hospice care at the end of life or hospital, hospitality. 
in a tourist town like Booth Bay Harbor. Hospitality is the major industry in town, right? And what's the most important phrase in the hospitality industry? Welcome and the customer is always right. No matter how rude or no matter how obnoxious, right? The customer is always right because that's how you, you make your money. Does that work in church? You know, the one thing you learn in church is we all can't be right. Wherever two or three are gathered in the midst of them, there shall be four opinions in the congregational church, right? We know being a part of church means we're not all right, but we try to be community anyway. It's a rich concept, hospitality, throughout the scriptures. Leviticus says, Every, treat the stranger well. Treat the stranger like a neighbor. Jesus said, the mark of discipleship is that you gave me a cup of cold water when I was thirsty. Are you listening, Texas legislature? A cup of cold water. You gave me food when I was hungry. You welcomed me when I was a stranger. You, you, Jesus taught that hospitality is a proactive kind of thing. You know, the story of the Good Samaritan, the, the Good Samaritan doesn't say, I'm sending you my thoughts and prayers while you're lying there in the ditch. He doesn't just come and say, are you okay? Can I call someone for you? He bandaged the wounds. He, he carried this injured man and put him on his own donkey, took him to the inn, and paid for him to stay to get well. That is proactive, deep, hospitality for another human being in need. Sorry, I lost my place for a second. Jesus often told stories where ministry revolved around eating together. The great banquet, the last supper, who you eat with matters. Jesus got in trouble for who he ate with. You're eating with sinners? What are you thinking, Jesus? It's not always going to win friends and influence people to show hospitality. We're told to welcome the stranger, but we don't always like strangers because they're strange by definition. So this focus scripture, I chose Hebrews 13 to do not neglect to show hospitalities to strangers because you may entertain angels unaware. And I love the Greek word for hospitality. This is your word for the day. Philoxenia. Philoxenia. Now, Philo, philo, so I've used this word a lot lately. It means the love of friendship. Philos, love of friendship. Xenia means stranger. Think xen xenophobia is the fear of strangers. So philos, love of friends. Xenia, stranger. You're to love the stranger like a friend. What a wonderful word for hospitality, and it pushes us deeper than just being polite or friendly at coffee hour, because friendship implies a trust, and a relationship is something that builds up over time, and you begin to count on each other and understand each other, and it endures. So what, what philoxenia means is we're willing to invite a stranger into a circle of friendship. That we're willing to invest ourselves in that person until they feel like they are truly one of us. It's the best practice of all ways of welcoming new members. They say if you make three friends in six months, you'll stay in the church. And if you don't, you'll probably leave. So it's, it's these friendships are so important because hospitality 
is an invitation to be a real, full part of a community. Now, I also really like the second half of Hebrews 13, 2, that says, you may be entertaining angels unaware. It means that something happens to both parties in this welcome. We're both going to be changed and shaped by it. It's not just good for the stranger. It's good for the inviter as well. What happens when you entertain an angel? In the Bible, angels may tell you something about the future, something about yourself, or give you a blessing. Jacob wrestled with an angel because he wanted a blessing. He wanted a sense that he was connected and loved by God, and he wrestled with that. Mary met an angel. She became the mother of Jesus. Be not afraid, Mary, for I bring you good news of great joy. I'm going to totally disrupt your life and make it very difficult, but it is going to bring about what God wants and desires for the world. Angels change us and disrupt us. So the text isn't saying, you know, if you show hospitality, God's going to reward you. It's saying, show hospitality and you'll probably discover something really important. The stranger might just be the messenger that you need. Now, Gene and I, we were early adopters of Airbnb, maybe like 2014. Um, and, and in the early days of Airbnb, you opened up your home and it wasn't like a separate apartment with a kitchen. It was like just down, it was the next door bedroom, right? And you, you shared a bathroom and you let somebody into your house and people said, oh, that's gonna be really risky, aren't you afraid? But it wasn't, it was wonderful. So many of the people that came to our home were visiting Smith College, which was down the street. And so we had lots of mothers and daughters that, that came and they were very anxious about this major life change of their daughters leaving home. And so often we were, it was almost a ministry, wasn't it? To help people sort of move into this change and to give them the face of someone who lived in Northampton that maybe their daughters would be okay in this new place or at least know someone. We welcome people from all over the world, China, South Korea, Dagestan, we, I remember I spent an hour with a guy who was in town for a conference because he was an expert in hoarding disorders. And he was giving a conference. It was fascinating to just hear the, how this disease worked and what to do in the, in the midst of it. And we found the same experience when we went to Airbnbs. We, we go to the same Airbnb every time in Acadia because we love the host. We, we love to hear about her life and we see how it's unfolding and we love to come back. We, we met someone in Dublin. Our Airbnb host had lived in Northampton and, and we connected right away and she, you know, we got up in the morning and she says, okay, I think I've got you sorted. I've never been sorted before, but now I've been sorted and she gave us this great itinerary this was the tour that was not in the tourist books, and it was phenomenal. And, and you see, this sort of hospitality has now become part of our experiences, and we are changed by the giving and the receiving of real hospitality with people that we didn't know who could have been strangers but become friends. We opened our home and didn't realize that we were opening our hearts to something new. So becoming a really welcoming church means discovering the angel in every person that walks through our door and what they might have to share with us. Because every person that joins a church changes the community in some way with their stories, their gifts, their experience, skills, and insights, and especially their questions. 
New people ask innocent questions. Why do you do things this way? We don't know. We've always done it this way, but now we'll have to think about that. We scratch our heads. We think. We get new energy, new ideas. Sometimes we think new people are angels, and sometimes we're not so sure. Diversity can feel like a threat. I, I found this in, uh, you know, churches often unconsciously are looking for more people who are just like them. I mean, it's human nature, right? Birds of a feather flock together. We're looking for people who are like us to join us. And I read dozens of church profiles in my last search process, and almost every single one of them said some version of this sentence. Help us reach young families with kids and respect our long-term traditions. <laughs> See, you get it. You understand that those are contradictory things that you cannot grow and stay the same at the same time, right? That's, that's true of anything, not just churches. Growth means change. It means overcoming the homeostasis that we're going through, whether you want to Learn a new language, lose weight, become a welcoming church. Growth means change. And this was really clear. In my first church in Poughkeepsie, I'd been there about seven years, and we'd taken in about 75 new members over time, and our attendance went from about 80 to about 115. We had a new generation coming into the church, and they wanted different things. They wanted the church to be more kid-friendly and oriented. They wanted some new hymns with more inclusive language and the church to be more socially engaged. And sometimes some of the long-term members started to feel a little displaced. They were actually outnumbered. And they no longer knew everyone in church, and the new people didn't know they were supposed to defer to them. <laughs> And I remember an annual meeting, one long-term member stood up, visibly upset, and she said, by a secret cabal. <laughs> and now this woman was not a firebrand. She wasn't a troublemaker. She was very quiet, just a good, solid church member. And she was frustrated with the amount of change that was happening. She was displaced, and so I thought, we need to respond gently to this because it's human. It's so very human. So I had all the deacons and all the trustees stand up in the meeting. And I said, I want you to count how many people of, of this group of leaders that you know them and have had one conversation with them. And people did their counting. And I said, how many of you know less than 50% of the deacons and trustees? Lots of hands went up, especially among the long-term members. And just seeing that, it, it started to shift the space and made some room to reflect. And the disconnect that people were feeling in church was very real, but it wasn't because there was a hostile takeover by a secret cabal. It was the growing pains of being a welcoming church. Because that's what success looks like. You're going to feel a little displaced as it happens, as you get the thing that you actually worked so hard, you now have to receive it and be it. And that congregation, once they realized that reality, then they said, oh, so what we really need to be doing is stop arguing about programs and policies, and we need to know each other. We need to deepen our sense of community before we do another thing. So let's return to my earlier question. What kind of restaurant do you think a church should be? Any ideas? What I hear up here? Ice cream. <laughs> everybody loves ice cream. Well, not everybody, right? What else? What kind of restaurant should we be? Family. A family restaurant. 
What buffet. else? Buffet. A buffet. Other ideas? I think I heard another one. Potluck. potluck. What else would a church be but a potluck, right? I think potluck is a wonderful symbol of what a church should be because it means everyone brings something they like and they share it. Everybody is who they are. And there's always enough to go around. You don't know how it's going to turn out. You just trust that it's going to happen. Sometimes you discover something truly wonderful like that Mexican mole chili and you really have to have the recipe for it. And you don't have to like everything, but you at least have to appreciate the effort that goes into a lime and pineapple jello salad. <laughs> Those are not easy to make, you know, and they're done with love as well. I've never been to a potluck where they ran out of food. There's always enough that anybody can walk through the door and they can be fed any stranger, there is enough. So what if we applied potluck principles to every part of the life of the church? Everything we do, budgeting, education, worship, it's all meant to be a big potluck that everybody brings their gifts, we all try something new, and we trust that there will be enough to have a vital community. You know, I've really come to believe that church vitality has less to do with the kind of programs you run or your strategic planning. I really think here's what we should start tracking as churches, as this is the vital metric of a healthy church. How many recipes get exchanged in a month? Because if you're exchanging recipes, a stranger becomes a friend and you honor each other, and you become a true sense of community as you, as you eat together and share together. Amen.